I believe in an unspoken ceremony that occurs when we watch movies. If an audience is to truly offer themselves to cinema, an acknowledgement must be made on behalf of the observer. To momentarily sacrifice their psychological and emotional bonds so that they be manipulated and moulded by the artist. The viewer must then accept that, as art is incapable of capturing one's own subjective experience, it can never fulfil all the questions of the individual. Art's preoccupation with secrecy can feast on the deepest parts of you, but its mysteries can also energise something profound within. I suppose cinema's true affliction, as well as its triumph, is that its answers are often destined to remain unknown, and nowhere is this more truthful than in the work of David Lynch. Let's fuck! I'll fuck anything that moves! <laughs> To quote Steve McQueen, cinema is still a baby. With this, we're reminded that amidst every advance the medium has made, we're yet to reach, and in fact may never see, the zenith of cinematic storytelling. Omniscience of the onlooker, a place where the rules of the form have been woven within our consciousness. But are there rules as to what cinema should be? Are there expectations for what moving images should or shouldn't do? In the process of making this essay, my aim was to discover what cinema means to David Lynch. Yet, even if we were to gain a perfect understanding of film, what Lynch does would still remain uniquely him. So I suppose the better question is what does David Lynch mean to cinema? I am going to find out one day. What is it that denotes the style of Lynch? Since catapulting into the mainstream psyche, his name has adopted more of an adjective than a noun. But what exactly does his name represent? Now, when people say Lynchian, what do they mean? I haven't got a clue. <laughs> I think when you're inside of it, uh, you can't see it. So I don't know. Yeah. The same way a hallway sinking into darkness is Lynchian, so is a white picket fence in a slice of Americana. To precisely state the meaning of the term, requires finding a specific order amongst a large variety of nuanced abstract creations. Examples are plentiful, but uniformity amongst them is rare. The definition exists in uncertainty. Yet therein lies the binding force of Lynch's approach. To be Lynchian is to exude elusiveness, and the enigma of what signifies Lynchian sensibilities lies in producing unfamiliarity in that which was once familiar. There's an obscure area of the fair spectrum nestled between safety and danger. It best describes an entity whose intentions we can't completely decipher. Freud coined this the uncanny, and it's the region of horror Lynch is most affiliated with. From plot structure to character behaviours, Lynch's movies are explicit in displaying a vagueness that's central to his work. Someone smiling shouldn't denote fear, but if that smile is ambiguous, This is how most of Lynch's scenes feel. We become filled with endless unease because every element that Lynch implements is done so without context. Uncertainty arises when we as viewers can't obtain enough information to fully comprehend the events that unfold around us. I've got good news. Lynch structures his movies in such a way that we only see glimpses of a fully formed idea. One character may have an unsettling reaction. <laughs> and another can explode with schizophrenic rage. Don't you fucking look at me! But unlike most directors, Lynch never shows any justification for this insanity. Here's a filmmaker who understands that the part will always be far stranger than the completed piece. Through focusing on his subjects through a figurative lens, which inhibits any exterior information, Lynch forms a perspective of a fundamental mistrust of everything we see. The same mistrust that proceeds to poison the world of our characters. To me, the mark of a Lynchian environment is one whose surface-level pleasantries disguise a hideous underbelly. 
Lynch said himself that he lives in extreme close-ups, and looking at things closer exposes their true nature. Whether it be the land of opportunity that is Hollywood, or the quaint town of Twin Peaks, they all hold terrible dangers hidden under a facade. And like all of Lynch's threats, we don't see them immediately, but the truth tucked away at their core is never completely concealed. Lynch toys with our psychology through offering flashes of the horror that surrounds us. We sense a threat in the air, and that feeling, that anxiety, acts to service the uncanny framework of his environments. So the abnormalities in Lynch's world aren't there simply to evoke weirdness. They work in conjunction with his other elements to heighten doubt in the viewer. We watch worlds that fluctuate in and out of danger, and this, alongside their erratic laws, means that our lack of understanding what's going on, and our inability to grasp onto something familiar only serves to generate hesitancy inside of us. For instance, what time period does Blue Velvet take place in? Of course, it seems like a contemporary 1980s, but the decor, the fashion, the way people talk, none of it is consistent. The trademark, unpredictable construction that Lynch provides takes many forms beyond just the environmental, but what it succeeds in is displaying a misshapen reality. In worlds where spontaneous absurdities are never questioned by its inhabitants, we feel that, by their accounts, what they're experiencing is rational. A scantily clad woman can dance on top of a car, and no one bats an eye. Don't be a good neighbour to her. This sporadic nature teaches us that anything can happen here, and that's the most terrifying thing. The world of Lynch remind me of a Francis Bacon painting, where nothing exists outside of what we see, and sometimes what we do see is unclear in both space and time. Lynch is direct in showing that his realities don't correspond with ours. With that knowledge, we understand that there are no rules as to the limits of these worlds, and upon revealing that the surroundings have the capability to harm us, and then showing that it has no restrictions in doing so, Lynch manufactures an atmosphere of constant distress. Whether or not something happens is irrelevant. We wait in anticipation, knowing that anything can. What further exacerbates this fear in Lynch's characters is that they're incapable of finding solace. For Lynch, the notion of safety, or the concept of home, goes undefined. Often, our characters' psychological fears manifest themselves in the form of an outsider, a being that acts as an invader to the home, the one place our characters could find refuge. And what's more frightening than a fear you can't escape? Of course. As a matter of fact, I'm there right now. What do you mean, you're where, right now? At your house. Lynch subliminally taps into ways to show that fear acts as a pervasive force in every circumstance, finding methods to make exterior threats interior. A distinctive motif for Lynch is to capitalise on spatial fears so that the subjects appear more exposed, creating a sense of vulnerability to the dangers around them. Yet the concept of fear acting as an all-encompassing force is most evident through the pacing of individual scenes. And for Lynch to create an even greater sense of unease, he doesn't utilise the visual, but the audible. Sound is an essential part of Lynch's process. Characters speak in very guttural tones. or at the very least, have distinctive voices. 
capítulos Spread Diseases and Massacre by Juicy Lab. And characters typically hold long pauses before continuing a dialogue, resulting in a very delayed and disjointed manner of talking. Hmm. A little boy went out to play. This continues to enrich the flavour of anticipation intrinsic to Lynch, but more significantly, this adds an emphasis to the surroundings of the subject. A characteristic of Lynch is to highlight the importance of room tone, subtly tweaking the ambient sound so that the presence from outside can be felt inside. Through this, we become more aware of a toxic climate that totally encapsulates every facet of the character's being. Fear invades everything. Lynch has said that his films are 50% visual and 50% sound, and one area that his films excel in is their ability to subliminally enhance the atmosphere through the sound of the space. The noises of his environments will often be exaggerated to punctuate the power this world has. and individual sounds will be overemphasized to signify how sinister things become in the mind of the character. No way, get out! Stop it! I'll tear your fucking heart out, girl! Lynch creates a sense of tension through sound that, like all his other details, can never be visibly identified. We know something to be wrong. It's all too unnatural. But the fact that we can't see it increases that level of mystery that elusiveness which makes Lynch so frightening. The idea of what is Lynchian to me is something that is so easy to recognise, yet almost impossible to explain. It persists in holding on to its secrets, but anything unknown has a kind of pull to it. It maintains the aura of mystery and the uncanny that is vital to Lynch. When we're shown everything, logic will reveal itself. But logic is not the realm that Lynch operates in. Anything taken without context can offer a level of abstraction that's far more interesting than if everything could be understood. Lynch makes a conscious effort to not divulge the meaning of his films, because to him, the idea that movies need to be explained is almost sacrilegious. A film is sort of like a book, and books get written, and the author maybe passes away, so you can't go talk to them and say, okay. what did you mean, you know? I really believe the film should stand on its own, and there should be nothing added, nothing subtracted, and you work a long time to make it just so. But I think to gain a greater understanding of the content of Lynch, the thought process behind his work must be taken into consideration. Lynch keeps faith in ideas, even if they're just brief snippets of imagery. If you catch an idea that you love, that's a beautiful, beautiful day. And that idea that you caught might just be a fragment of the whole, whatever it is you're working on. But now you have even more bait. Thinking about that small fragment will bring in more. And they'll come in and they'll hook on. And more and more come in and pretty soon you might have a script. He said that Blue Velvet began as Red Lips, Green Lawns, and The Song. Then it was an ear lying in a field. That was it. And to this day, he claims that he still has no idea what the box in Mulholland Drive means. Lynch discovers the meaning in his work as he progresses, leading to an even further degree of ambiguity. We understand that Lynch brands indefinite abstractions in his filmic universes, but why? Why must everything remain deceptive? In his book on meditation, Lynch said that ideas are like fish. If you want to catch little fish, you stay in shallow water. But if you want to catch the big fish, you've got to go deeper. Lynch's ideas aren't directly connected with one another, yet they all stem from the same source. 
a multitude of conceptual thoughts emerging from his subconscious means that there is never a complete unification of any idea. They all appear fragmented because Lynch relies on these thoughts buried within him to reveal their own meanings in context of one another. And so in a sense, it's vital that there be no absolutes for Lynch, because his movie's aim is to reach in and pull something out that is unique to every individual. That unspoken ceremony that I mentioned is more necessary than ever when watching the films of Lynch, because his work emerges from a place within his subconscious and seeks to activate something within our own. My first feature, Eraserhead, I did not know what these things meant to me, you know, really meant. I should know the meaning for me, but when things get abstract, it does me no good to say what it is, you know. It's better, all viewers on the surface were all different. So you do know, you do know, for yourself. And what you know is valid. He may not fully comprehend it, but it's filmmaking based on intuition a combination of both intellect as well as emotion. Simply searching for a solution that feels right as opposed to one that is thematically perfect. Finding the answer from within. Beneath the calm exterior is, you know, the subconscious, right? And uh, that's where everyone has their little, uh, well, not little, but, you know, the denizens of the deep and all that. And this film, a lot of people say is, uh, a real sort of subconscious experience. It, it unearths things that are inside of people. Lynch is heavily influenced by transcendental meditation to gain a greater sense of self-awareness and search for answers inside yourself. And we can't underestimate the importance of this in his work. It helps explain why his films exhibit moments wherein the realm of the conscious becomes completely blurred. Lynch finds in himself multiple layers of consciousness and replicates this inside his films. We simply don't know what constitutes pure reality. Is the subconscious reality? Which surface that we see is the true surface? Lynch externalizes the numerous layers of consciousness into something tangible in his films. The way that we pass in and out of our subconscious mentally, Lynch creates works of art where his subjects have to do it physically. A constant theme that reinforces this is dualism. Scenes appear almost as parallels of one another, playing out in one form. Then I cry, 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 and then I say with big emotion, I hate you! I hate us both! Only to show up again later. or characters may be duplicates of one another, emphasizing Lynch's perspective of multiple sides to everything in life, a theme even evident in his painting. Lynch submits a series of breaches to what we accept as our reality in the hope that we recognize that what we perceive is only a fraction of what we see. And it's exactly why Lynch intentionally misguides our perceptions through offering plots that embrace a subconscious manner of storytelling. Our expectations so often go unfulfilled in his movies because he shows that we expect so much from life, yet know so little. Pauline Kael referred to David Lynch as the first populist surrealist. Although his work is puzzling and more often than not intended to be so, he still manages to strike a chord with the way we feel. The very nature of a nightmare is based on the subjectivity of a person. It's difficult to translate that fear to someone else because it's what was scary to you. But Lynch manages to materialize that feeling into his work. Through establishing a fear we can't quite comprehend and forcing us to view it beyond a field of logic. David Lynch didn't come into the art world through cinema and maybe that was beneficial for him as he had no preconceived notions as to the capabilities of the medium. But what he offers is something completely idiosyncratic of him. A kind of cinema that allows the audience to look inside of themselves for a meaning, and perhaps in turn, gain a greater self-awareness of the world around them. The answers are right in front of our eyes. It's up to you how willing you are to find them. <laughs>